Uh, thanks very much, uh, Ravi, and thanks to the organisers for the opportunity to talk today. And, uh, and thank you to Peter Hansen for the opportunity to show uh, an interesting index case for this presentation as well. Um, Look, I think it's important to, at the outset, just um, reiterate that in the context of this, um, intervention for bicuspid valve uh, surgery, by and large, uh, is the optimal uh, treatment strategy unless there is a significant contraindication uh, to it. Um, and it's worthwhile noting that um, with all of the TABI um, literature that we've been discussing, most bicuspid patients were excluded from the major randomised trials. Um, this is a slide from Professor Mao Chen, um, and this looks at the incidence of uh, bicuspid valve and TABI registries, and it's quite apparent that it's extremely low uh, around the world, with the exception of China, and, um, and, and I guess there are a couple of uh, theories as to why that is the case, but I think it probably reflects the lower age group of the population in general being treated uh, in these areas. Nonetheless, they have extensive experience with it. Uh, and, and the problem with bicuspid aortic valves is there's uh, asymmetrical calcification that can occur. You get heterogeneity of leaflet morphology and asymmetry, and occasionally very calcified uh, raphe. It, it's a very eccentric annulus and calcification in the outflow tract. And the issue is it's often associated with aortopathy and angulation, and this makes it very challenging. The, the traditional classification by Sievers uh, de defines it based on uh, the, the number of um, cusps and uh, commissures and, and raffes. And uh, um, in general, the, the vast amount of data we have, not vast, the, the data that we have uh, in the transcatheter space is usually limited to the type 1 in the majority of cases. Uh, there are different categor uh, other categorizations based on the coronary uh, placement and the placement of the raffe. There have been some alternate classifications that have come about in the transcatheter era, and they still need validation. But you know, it, you know, from my way of thinking, I think an ideal classification would will incorporate both TABI outcomes and uh, morphology. So the case presentation is an 86-year-old female with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, uh, a BSA of 1.8, and she lives independently but has significant medical comorbidity. Um, she's got severe asthma, um, and she's got concomitant bronchiectasis, minor coronary disease, and some renal impairment as well. She's got atrial fibrillation, and she's hypertensive. And a transmassic echo that you can see um, confirms the presence of uh, severe calcific aortic stenosis in the context of a depressed ejection fraction, um, her pulmonary, um, and uh, her carotid Doppler scan showed just mild bilateral disease. Um, just for brevity, her coronary anatomy was essentially normal, just minor irregularities. Um, a TAVI CT scan showed that she had a uh, adequate access uh, uh, for a transfemoral approach, uh, if that was to be the case. For TAVI CT scan, we can just sort of dwell on this, and for um, the, 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 um, the pundits on the panel, they'll notice that, um, first of all, this is indeed a bicuspid valve, but it's a type 0 bi bicuspid valve, uh, which is a uh, there's less data available on this, um, and the operators have um, very appropriately done some uh, annular sizing measurements, and they've also looked at some supraannular uh, measurements, looking at, um, uh, first of all, the intercommissural distance um, and um, uh, an, an annular dimension about four millimetres above the true um, annulus. Um, they've taken note of the coronary heights, which were adequate, and they've taken time to measure uh, the, the bulkiness and the size of, uh, of the cusps as well to exclude uh, the risk of coronary exclusion. So um, in the presentation to the heart team, it was an 86-year-old lady with, uh, who was deemed to be at high risk for a conventional surgery in the context of uh, severe lung disease um, and some chronic renal impairment. Um, and based on that, she was accepted for a transcatheter implantation. Um, a note was made of the fact that it was a Sievers type 0, um, and the, the, the plan was to use um, a repositional TABI valve and Evolute R, which has been elegantly demonstrated um, in, the, in the case before. Um, some of the challenges in TABI that we know about is um, uh, it's a very asymmetrical valve, um, large dimensions, a lot of calcification, sizing is an issue, angiographic delineation is an issue, um, there can be issues with valve crossing, and there's often concomitant aortic regurgitation. 
And the problem relates to your result. If you have incomplete, incomplete expansion, you get residual gradients, thrombosis, and there's questions on lethal durability. Uh, you can get malalignment, uh, annular rupture is an issue, and paravalvular leaks. Um, there's some controversies on sizing, and, and I hope we have time for the panel to um, um, have, have a discussion related to this, um, related to where do you actually size these, um, these valves at the annulus, do you use a balloon valvuloplasty with an aortogram to see you've got an adequate seal? Do you size the intercommissural distance or do you look above? Um, there's some talk about where you actually place these valves and, uh, and the issue really relates to your appreciation of the calcification and where it sits and it sits supraannular which uh, provides the best, uh, the best seal. Um, and I think this relates to really the degree of calcification in the raffe and the valves. Um, hopefully we'll get a, a chance briefly to talk about a concept of reshaping um, the annulus and this has been uh, done predominantly. Professor uh, Mao Chen in China has uh, developed a new annular uh, strategy and I'm interested in Darren and uh, Peter and uh, David if you've had some experience with this as well. So I'll just get on to the case over here and in this particular instance they went ahead and um, did a, a valvuloplasty. They didn't do an aortogram at the time, they had determined they were going to do a supraannular placement. And what you can see here is, uh, as was demonstrated in the last case, is there's a pigtail catheter in the distal part of the coronary cusp. And you'll notice over here that the, the tip of the, of, of the valve leaflet is extremely high uh, for a conventional tricuspid implant. And they're aiming to get a, a, an implant of about zero or, or even um, one. Um, and, and this is so they're actually going to be aiming for uh, the, the valve to hold at a supraannular level. Um, the next position shows that they've really achieved that very nicely. Um, and you can also see that the valve looks uh, to be fairly well deployed and that there doesn't seem to be a, 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 any um, um, a constriction. It's useful to look in a coaxial view when this comes about just to ensure that that's actually the case. Um, and you'll notice over here that it's actually not the case. Uh, and this is sort of typical with bicuspid anatomy is that with the heavy calcification in the supraannular region, you get a constriction of the tabby prosthesis in this area. Now, uh, I guess there are a couple of aspects that you need to consider at this point, and the first of all is what is the, um, uh, is there a pressure gradient or if there's a lot of aortic regurgitation? And in this case, there was a significant pressure gradient without aortic regurgitation, uh, and they went on to do a, a balloon post dilatation with a good result. So I'll just show you. Day one post, uh, this is the, uh, the transvasic echo. Um, I think you'd agree that it's probably trivial to know aortic regurgitation in this view. There was a residual gradient of a peak of 19 and a mean of 11. So before jumping in for time, I just um, perhaps we could go to some panel discussion. Uh, yeah, any, any comments from um, our panel? Uh, uh, on, on this case, this is a very challenging case. I think the bicuspid um, valves are very challenging. Uh, if you read the current literature, you think, oh, we've solved all the problems with bicuspid valves, but I don't think that's the case. And I think the Chinese cohort, I don't think we've got our head around that. They're, they're often s smaller annuluses, um, and they're being classified as bicuspid. In the West, we often see bicuspid valves with very large annuluses, they're later descending aortas, and the annulus is often, they're a group of patients who simply exceed the recommended sizes for the current valves. And the question is, can you treat those patients? And I think you can if you place them superannular. When the patient's uh, annulus size falls within um, the recommended size ranges for the valve, you can size at an annual level because you'll still get a seal. But it's that population that we see uh, in Western patients where they often have very large annuluses, delayed in ascending any orders. Um, uh, I think they're a slightly different, I think it's clear that bicuspid valves are a heterogeneous group and there have been various classifications. The ones we see in the Western are very large annuluses and in that situation, you better to size and place the valve in that superannular position. Um, so I've been asked to, to butt in as well. Um, the big concern about these valves, we have this with 
surgical valves that we implant. We cut out the calcium, the orifice is uh, ovoid. These valves don't work properly. And we even a sutured valve in this situation, the leaflets don't open nicely. You can get valvular AR. One leaflet won't open properly, a pinwheel. The big risk is these are the patients who, who get um, thrombosis on their, on their leaflets as well. As well as that, the stress force on the leaflets when they don't open and collapse properly is a lot more. Now, obviously, this is an elderly lady in the long term, it's not, not super critical, um, but wear and tear on this valve is going to be a lot more than the wear and tear on a, a well deployed valve. I think it's a notional advantage too from a uh, core valve or an epaulet arm because the leaflets are uh, positioned in a super angular fashion again. And so it tolerates uh, a lack of circularity better than other valve types. Yeah, so we, we were certainly concerned about all those uh, points uh, raised. Um, in the end, we were quite concerned to see how constrained the valve was in the right ventricular, uh, the area of core of view. It was really very elliptically shaped rather than circular. And I think. Reshaping the annulus is nice that you can do it, but you could see what happened when we first dilated this valve. It expanded and then it recoiled straight away. And I think you have to be careful you don't overdo the so called reshaping. Um, in the end, you got a very nice result. There's a small gradient, there's no power value of a leak, open and left ventricular function will improve. And she is 86 after all, and uh, I think it was a, not an unreasonable patient to attempt this type of treatment in, even though it was a so called C to zero. I, th I think Aubrey raises a very important point that whilst it's feasible to do this, the issue is about uh, an optimal result acutely and the longevity and durability of these results. So I think, you know, I think it took me out of this forum, I don't want anyone to go away thinking uh, TAVI is a viable long-term option for low-risk uh, bicuspid disease. And just briefly, I've just got a slide up here, just on, on, on the data that is available, and there's not a lot out there. I know Raj McCall's group has looked at some propensity match data between tricuspid and bicuspid, looking at earlier generation devices where the results were poor, for, for all the reasons that have been mentioned. And, and, and with some improvement in the newer generation devices, but still um, not as satisfactory as with the tricuspid. So, you know, I, I think, I think it, it's important to note, and, and Ravi, just to... To, to, you know, it's a, th it's a therapeutic option in carefully selected patients using newer devices, but there's limited data um, to look at long-term survival and valve hemodynamics. And I think in younger patients with long life expectancy and unfavor, it's, it's really not going to be an option. Uh, we, we really, are, my feeling is that this is going to be limited to patients who are at, um, have significant comorbidities precluding surgery. Thank you, Rob.